Welcome to the Books of Titans podcast, where I seek truth in the world's best books. I'm your host, Eric Rostad, coming to you from the beautiful Books of Titans studio in Franklin, Tennessee. My goal is to read 52 books per year and share what I'm learning. I'll talk a bit about each book, tie ideas together from a variety of genres, and share the one thing I always hope to remember from each book. Today, I'm going to cover Master of the Senate by Robert A. Carroll. This is the third of four books that are part of Carroll's The Years of Lyndon Johnson series. This is book 10 for my 2021 reading list. Well, if you missed the first two episodes of this series, I encourage you to go back and listen to those before you listen to this one. I'll link to those in the top of the show notes for, for this episode, but I'll be referring to those uh, throughout. In the first episode of this series, I started off by saying that Robert Caro, in his introduction of the first book, says, you cannot understand LBJ unless you understand the hill country of Texas. And the reason for that is that the, the hill country of Texas was really almost like a mirage. It was this stunningly beautiful land. And just picture yourself, if, you, if you're walking west, you are, have been walking on flat land and all of a sudden you come to these beautiful green hills. It was beautiful, but it was only skin deep. The soil was very shallow. And so if you planted any seed in that soil, and if a rain came and a heavy rain came, it would just, it would just wash away all of the seed that you had just put into the ground. So despite the land being beautiful and it looking like a, a, an abund, abundant area where crops would be plentiful, it was, it was not. It was deceptive and it ruined a lot of families. LBJ's family was one of those families that was ruined. His father, Sam, was, was actually a politician as well. And he was known for being an honest politician, which means that you could not buy him. He would not take money. He would actually... Uh, go so far as to pay for all of his own meals, all of his own drinks. And he ended up being a very well-respected man and someone who helped people at both the political level, but also at the personal level. But he also fell for that mirage and he bought a bunch of land at too high of a price and was wiped out in the hill country, in the, the rains, to the point where he died in debt. He, his wife, Rebecca, and their eldest son, LBJ, and their other children suffered tremendous humiliation as a result of this. Uh, just you think of a small town, small town America, everyone knows who everyone is, and they are absolutely humiliated. They go from kind of being at the top, uh, well-respected, to being in debt, not being able to pay bills, and just being kind of the laughing stock of the town. LBJ never forgot that. He never forgot what that humiliation felt like. And he made it one of his life go life's goals to not end up like his father. In fact, his main takeaway from childhood was that it was his father's honesty and his mother's idealism that was to blame for that humiliation. He watched other politicians take the money and get rich and, and be well off and he saw his father as being an honest politician. He saw that honesty lead to ruin and humiliation. He saw his mother, his mother's love of books, his mother's love of, of talking about ideas. He also said that that was the reason or thought that that was the reason that that led to their humiliation because it wasn't doing, it was, it was just talking. And so while, the, while this theme of LBJ hating idealism came up in the first two books, I didn't really understand what that meant in full until this book, this third book, Master of the Senate. For it's in this book that LBJ's pragmatism beats out idealism, and it beats it out to pass the 1957 Civil Rights Act in the Senate. So here's the contrast between idealism and pragmatism as Carroll writes about it in the intro of Master of the Senate. Icons of the fight for social justice, the Humphreys and Douglases and Lehmans and the generations of liberal senators before them, eloquent, courageous senators, men of principles and ideals, had been trying for decades to pass a civil rights bill with absolutely no success. It was not until Lyndon Johnson, who had never before fought in their cause, picked up the banner of civil rights that it was carried at last nearer to its goal. It took a Lyndon Johnson with his threats and deceits, with a relentlessness 
with which he insisted on victory and the savagery with which he fought for it to ram that legislation through. Abraham Lincoln struck off the chains of black Americans, but it was Lyndon Johnson who led them into the voting booths, closed democracy's sacred curtain behind them, placed their hands upon the lever that gave them a hold on their own destiny, made them at last and forever a true part of America's political life. His great voting rights legislation, the supreme accomplishment of his life and his career, would be passed during his presidency. It was then that he most firmly took the hands of black Americans, but he first reached for their hands, not as president, but in the Senate. So finally, this book is a study of the story of American Senate itself. For all the remarkable aspects of the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1957, none is more remarkable than the fact that it was in the Senate that it was hammered into shape and passed. End quote. That section, those two paragraphs, really set the tone for this 1,040-page book. It covers the years of Lyndon B. Johnson from 1949, when he first enters the Senate, to the start of 1961, where he is now vice president and is joining JFK. Lady Bird describes these years as being the happiest of their lives. This book won the Pulitzer Prize, the first and only of the series to do so. I finished it a few days ago, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to give it some time, but I am completely enamored with this book. It is one of the best books that I've ever read. And as I was reading it, I kept having this thought that if this book had been a novel, if this book had been a work of fiction, my guess is that it would have been rejected for being out of any reasonable realm of possibility. The challenges that LBJ overcomes, the change LBJ makes in the Senate, and the complete reversal of his past voting record on civil rights, they're, they're just so outlandish that it would, it would have to be released under fantasy if it, if it was a work of fiction. No one would believe that this would be possible in, in, a, in a general story. And the, uh, but, but this did, this did happen. I mean, this is U.S. history, and, and, and it, it's a history that has been shaped by this man. So as for the reading stats for this book, it took me 46 hours and 11 minutes to read it. That is the second longest book for this project uh, since I've been tracking how long it takes to read the, uh, these books. The, the, the longest one was, was the Bible, but this came in as, as second. I read it from February 26th through March 23rd, so that averaged uh, 40 pages per day for this 1,040-page book. In the next segment, I'll go a little deeper into what LBJ did uh, as a senator. I'll talk a little bit about the structure of this book and then go further down that rabbit hole of pragmatism versus idealism, ambition versus compassion, and then share a few other things that stuck out in this book. And then in segment three, I will close it as I I do all episodes with the one thing, my one key takeaway from Master of the Senate. The first 105 pages of this book are about the Senate. I mean, it's really amazing. You you hardly see a thing about LBJ, but you're learning about the founding of the country and what the purpose was, what the founders had in mind for the Senate, why it was set up the way it was, and the rules that that kind of the the official rules and the just as it grew, the the rules of the Senate, how they came into place and how they were they were solid rules. This was a a body that did not change much. So you get to know about the Senate, the the original purpose, the how it how it evolved, and then you get to know about some of the leading men in the Senate uh, at the time that LBJ is joining in 1949. You read about Richard Russell and Hubert Humphreys, Frank Church and William Noland. Richard Russell, uh, I as a freshman at the University of Georgia, I lived in Russell Hall, and it was named after Richard Russell. Didn't know a single thing about him until I read this book. 
As a child, I went to see the Minnesota Twins play in the Hubert H. Humphrey Metrodome. Didn't know a thing about Hubert Humphrey, and uh, this book spends a lot of time on him. So that, that was a joy just to get to know these people who I'd, I'd seen their names at different parts in my life, but, um, but got to know more about them in this book. So that's, that's the first part. Then the rest of the book, they, the, whole, the whole book is leading up to the passage of this 1957 Civil Rights Act. So as you're reading about this, you're getting to know what it was like for a black woman named Margaret Frost in Eufaula, Alabama, to try to register to vote in January 1957. It was impossible. It was an endless catch-22. Whatever she went in to do, they said that was not enough, even though she had fulfilled all of the things that it was said that she needed to do to vote. And so you just see the impossibility of, of this situation. You get a primer on the civil rights movement and some of the terribly tragic events that, that shocked the nation. You go deep into LBJ's quick rise in the Senate, uh, where he joins in 1949 after the stolen election highlighted in the previous episode, to becoming the minority leader in 1952 as a 44-year-old, and then just two years later, later becoming the majority leader in 1954. And you find out what that actually means, a minority leader and a majority leader of the Senate, what they're supposed to do, uh, how LBJ took that role into something that had not been envisioned and uh, just took it to places it had never been. You read about the fact that a civil rights bill had not been passed in Senate for over 80 years. And you read about the unbelievable odds that LBJ faced in the Senate to get this passed. You read about how LBJ truly became a master of the Senate. How Robert Caro said, and when on the floor Lyndon Johnson was running the Senate, he put on a show so riveting that Capitol Hill had never seen anything like it during the previous half century and a half of the Republic's existence, as it has never seen anything like it since. End quote. In the last episode, I, I said that I kept writing evil in the margin of the book. And I didn't necessarily like that I was doing that. It was just my natural reaction, and it was a visceral reaction. It was one that made my heart beat uh, more and in anger, and my only response was just to write evil over and over in the margin of the book. And I share that as that being my one th thing, my one key takeaway from from that book. And it was my key takeaway because it was, sh it was shocking to me. I don't usually do that when I'm reading a book, I'm just writing evil over and over in the margin. But that, that was just my, my response as reading the book. So what did I write in this book? What did I write in Master of the Senate over and over again in the margin? I wrote two things. One was, wow, Wow. It did over and over. Wow. At what LBJ was able to accomplish, the, the changes he made in, a, in a, the Senate body that had not been altered in that drastic of a way in its entire history. Wow. At the things he pulled, the, the things he did to, to get this passed. I, I just, I mean, almost every other page, there's, there's a wow, it's just something that was so shocking. And in, in a good way, I mean, just that he was able to do, to do these things. Some of them were in a bad way as well. It just, again, kind of being overcome by the, just the evil of the man, but, but also the wow at the pragmatism and, and how that played out. The second thing was quid pro quo. And that is this for that, that that's what that means, and basically a, a trade-off. So you see this over and over in the book. Uh, as, as LBJ becomes the master of the Senate, it is largely based on this, I will do this if you do that. If you vote this way on this bill, I will vote this way on this bill, or I'll get, I'll get other people to vote this way on this bill. Or maybe it could be if you don't vote this way, then maybe I release this information about you and your mistress. Or I do this. And the LBJ was always whispering in, in the other senator's ears. And so you just kind of wonder, <laughs> what did he have on these people? And, and what, did he, what did he say to get his desired response? So th that's uh, a little bit of the structure 
of how the book is set up and then some of my kind of initial reactions, I want to now highlight just three different things that stuck out to me. And the first is the title of the book. As I've highlighted in, in the, the other episodes, especially the second episode, uh, <clears throat> Robert Caro's titles are, are fantastic. And this one is fantastic as well, because Master of the Senate is what LBJ became. <clears throat> but the Senate was not supposed to have a master. And so a, lar- a large part of this book is dedicated to, to that history, that history of the Senate, in, in that it was set up in such a way as to not have a master. And I want to read a, a section here because this, this highlights what it meant for LBJ to become, to become the master of the Senate. So here we go. Sometimes he would indulge in an even more blatant manifestation of his power. Somehow the vote hadn't worked out as he had thought it would. He was a vote or two short of victory. So a vote or two would be changed right out in the open. Johnson would walk across the floor to a senator who had been in opposition and whisper to him. And the senator would rise in the signal and signal the clerk that he had been incorrectly recorded. You would see votes changed right in front of your eyes, the Senate aide said. Neil McNeil, who knew the Senate so well, could hardly believe what he was seeing. He did it in front of God, McNeil was to, to recall. It didn't happen much, but it happened. He was absolutely brazen about it. He put the arm arm on guys right on the floor. Sometimes Johnson would not even bother to walk across the floor. Once he yelled across the well to Freer, who was sitting at his desk, Change your vote, Alan! The senator from Delaware did not immediately respond to Johnson, so Johnson yelled again, in a shout heard in the words of one writer by more than 80 senators and the galleries, Change your vote, Alan! Alan changed his vote. My God, the man was running the world. Power enveloped him. End quote. He, he would just yell out for somebody to change their vote. And they did it. That's the, that's the level of power that LBJ rose to. This was supposed to be a body of, of individuals representing their states. And he turned it into one where he, he almost had absolute control. It was astounding to read about. He, he overtook the Southern block of the Senate and did it in a way that they didn't even realize he was doing it. These, are, these were men who were accustomed to political maneuvers, were accustomed to people trying to take advantage. And so they were on the lookout for this type of thing. And he just, he did, he changed the seniority system of, of usually you would have to wait until you were very old to get appointed positions within the Senate uh, on committees and, and that sort of thing. He changed that whole seniority system within two weeks. It had not been changed since the founding of the country. And he changed it in two weeks, and they didn't even know that he had changed it. He just did it right in front of their face. He was that good. He was the master of the Senate. That's the first thing. The second thing is that uh, as I highlighted in in the other episodes, LBJ had a work ethic based on that ambition. He wanted to be the president. He knew he wanted to be the president since since a young age, and so that that ambition drove him. And many times it drove him into the hospital. In this book, the same thing happened. He drove himself into the hospital. And this time it was a little more serious because it was a heart attack. He had a heart attack in 1955. And what was, uh, was interesting is that he, he, he knows he's having a heart attack and he's being driven to the hospital and he's not quite sure he's going to make it. And so he says to the person in the car, um, Oltorf, he said, he says this, I want to tell you where I think my will is. And he told him where he thought it was. And then he said, if it's not there, I I just want to tell you what I want. I want Lady Bird to have everything I have. She has been a wonderful, wonderful wife. And she has done so much for me. She just deserves everything I have. That's what was in my will. End quote. And so it was just a, uh, such a nice sentiment. I mean, uh, LBJ has just treated her so poorly throughout his life. Uh, 
he he just humiliates her in front of everything uh, in front of others and for a man who his deepest fear was that humiliation of, of going back to that humiliation he experienced as a child in the hill country of texas he turns that and he just humiliates his wife all the time but when it came down to it when he thought he was going to die i want lady bird to have everything i have she has been a wonderful wonderful wife it was just such a, a beautiful thing. And and you could kind of get a little emotional, perhaps, but then you get to the next paragraph and uh, LBJ talks about what he'd like for his mistress. So he says this, then he asked me, did I ever see Alice Glass? That was something he very seldom asked me. And I said, I saw her off and on. And he said, how is she? And I said, all right. And then he said something I didn't tell you and I don't think I'm going to, end quote. And so there's a little mystery there as well. So um, this was this person speaking to Robert Carroll and Robert Carroll talking about it. And so the person said he asked about Alice Glass. So that was the second thing. But then there was a third thing that he said something that I didn't tell you and I don't think I'm going to. So this person who said uh, LBJ first was concerned about his wife, second concerned about his mistress, and then the third thing he would not even mention. So that's just kind of a mystery for for history of of uh, the three most important things to him, as he thought that he was going to die. But it but it it begs another question, and something I thought about as I continued reading on past the section of the heart attack. What if LBJ had died in 1955? from that heart attack. He, he got pretty close. He actually had to recuperate for about nine months before he could go back to the Senate. How would he have been remembered if he had died then? How would he have been remembered? This was, this was before the Civil Rights Act was passed in 1957. He had changed Senate. He had changed the way Senate operated. He had done a lot. He was called one of the best senators there ever was. But how would he have been remembered if he had died then in 1955? Which is kind of an interesting what if of, of history. But he did make it. And we get to the third thing that I thought about. And it's tied in to that second thing of, of the heart attack. And it was a question I had is, did the heart attack change LBJ? Did he have some sort of a spiritual awakening of sorts? Or did something, did that spark something? Because up to that point, he had voted 100% of the time with the South in regards to civil rights. He had never once voted for civil rights. He had always voted against it. Even on an anti-lynching bill, he voted against that. 100% of the time. Would this heart attack change him? Would, would, would it give him more compassion? And so there, there's this question, and, and Caro addresses it throughout the book, what happens if there, if there was compassion on LBJ's side, and that mixed with his ambition to become president? Remember in the, in the first episode, I said that uh, Caro presents LBJ as being a man whose ambition was his moral framework. So everything went through that lens. The ambition to become president, that was the most important thing. Nothing was to get in the way of that. Nothing. Not questions of morality, what uh, doing the right thing. Nothing would get in that way of him becoming president. So when we look at this shift, because all of a sudden he's been voting against civil rights for the, for the last 20 years, and then all of a sudden there's this shift to where he starts he starts putting forward the Civil Rights Act and starts fighting for it and makes it and, and just puts his all into this. So what what shifted? Well, it was not some sp sort of spiritual transformation or something like that. I mean, if we look at LBJ's actual words and actions, I, I cannot even talk about them in this episode because I'd probably be taken off of a pod the podcasting platform for the, the words he used, the things he did. So even to discuss that, I mean, they're, they're, they're in this book, but the man was not changed in his attitude towards black Americans. But 
something did shift, and that shift was that whatever compassion he did have, it started to begin to align with his ambition to become president. And he knew that if he was going to become president, he had to be on that other side of civil rights. He had to get the approval of the Northern the northern senators, and then just the northern population. He was known as a Southerner. He, is, he had voted with the so- South, and there had never been a president from the South. So they, he knew that to become president, to, to move forward in that bis- ambition to become, a pre- hit, become president, he was going to have to change. And that's what brought about this change. It wasn't the heart attack. It wasn't rethinking life. It was that... Any camp compassion he had, it, and he did have some, and this book highlights that, but that compassion finally matched with his ambition. Before in his life where those things were at odds, when his any compassion he had was at odds with his ambition, ambition won every single time. But here came a situation, the Civil Rights Act, to where his ambition and his compassion were finally aligned. So you read this book and you see what it took for LBJ to get this bill passed in 1957. I don't think anyone else could have done it. Eisenhower had, had sort of half-heartedly stood behind the bill, but he didn't, ha- he didn't have any power to pass the legislation. So you see LBJ's cajol- cajoling, the, th- the threats that he did, the, dis- the destruction of men, the verbal abuse, his racism the racism of others who he was buddy-buddy with, and the evil means that he took to get a right end. And it just begs the question, what do you do with that? I asked that question in the last episode, uh, do, do, do the ends justify the means? Do evil ends justify good means? And that's the power of this book and of this series as a whole. LBJ's life makes you confront these questions. There's the idealism versus the pragmatism. There's the compassion versus the ambition. Do the important things move forward because of pragmatic people doing whatever it takes, good or bad, to accomplish a goal? Or do the important things move forward from principled and idealistic men and women? Do we have to have an LBJ doing everything, using every means possible, every evil bad means to get a good thing accomplished or can those things move forward because of principled and idealistic men and women well my one key takeaway my my one thing for master of the senate is the answer to that question Do we need the pragmatist to push forward these important things through evil means? Or do the important things move forward from principled and idealistic men and women? Well, the answer came in this book, and it came in the form of a quote by a journalist on page 942. And on page 942, we are still in the midst of this Civil Rights Act making its way through the Senate. At this point, it's largely been stripped of most of its power. It's just a, a minor part of what it once was. And all the substance has been taken out. At this point, it's just a matter of getting it passed so that there is something passed, something that breaks this 82 years of not having any civil rights acts passed. It's to get the ball rolling, and LBJ is using all of his power to get this to get this one thing going, even though it's largely been stripped. So that's that's the situation when, when we read this quote by journalist Murray Kempton. He says this, No one was going to remember the name of any of those men on the Senate floor. I will read to our children the names of every child born in Georgia in the last 40 years, and I will tell you now that they will recognize only the names of Ralph Ellison and Willie Mays and Hank Aaron. They will not know Harry Bird. Who did Mississippi put out lately that William Faulkner could talk to, except Richard Wright? It is people like these who are the legislators of mankind. They are more to the point than any senator can be. 
Our children's children's children will remember poets. They are unlikely to remember Lyndon Johnson. End quote. They will remember poets, but they will not remember Lyndon Johnson. So let me ask you a question. Who do you think about when you think about civil rights? And let me narrow down the choice to just two people. Do you think about Martin Luther King Jr.? Or do you think about Lyndon B. Johnson? Well, the answer for me is that I think of Martin Luther King Jr. This, reading this series of books by Robert Carroll, this is the first I have learned about LBJ. I did not learn about him in school, or if I did, I don't recall what I learned. But I learned a lot about MLK, and, and I, I recall a lot of, about that. We have a year, a day of the year of the calendar of the United States dedicated to Martin Luther King Jr. We don't have one for LBJ. We listen to the I Have a Dream speech. We quote it. We, we, we consider that an important speech in the history of the United States. We do not listen to LBJ's address to both houses of Congress in 1964 for the Civil Rights Act when he was president. So who won? So who, who actually put this forward? Was it MLK's speeches? Was it the idealism of MLK? And, and I'm not saying that MLK was just an idealist. He was very much, he very much had skin in the game. But was it the idealist or was it the pragmatist who history remembers? Did you have to have that person ramming it through or would it have happened eventually as the conscience of the conscience of the nation was changed by the idealist? It's an important question to ponder. I think that what LBJ despised about idealism and the idealist is that they were largely people without skin in the game. It would be the man or the woman who would give a speech, but not put into practice what they, they preached. So LBJ was fueled by this ambition, and it was all about the action. He was a man of action. He hated the people who just spoke and nothing ever happened. And so you, you, get, you get a lot of contrast in this book. So, for instance, Hubert Humphrey could give a fantastic speech, but LBJ looked at that man and said, he can't get anything done. When LBJ's ambition was aligned with a righteous cause, miracles would happen. But when it was not, tremendous damage would be done. So I have a confession, uh, whereas in the last episode I referred to LBJ as an evil bastard, uh, I actually found myself starting to like the man in this book. I still think he is evil. I still wrote evil quite a bit in the margins, but I wrote wow in the margins more in, the, in this book. And wow at what he was able to accomplish. It, it, it is really incredible. So I'm, I'm more enthralled with with how he did what he did that was that was really incredible and the series as a whole is just one where you are confronted with all these different sides of the story and you've you've got to to come away with an answer to to these difficult questions of do the ends justify the means uh do is the idealist more important than the pragmatist These are great questions, and what's so great is that there's so many people that Carol writes about in these books that you that you get these contrasts of of characters. You get these contrasts throughout these books of LBJ versus someone else, a man of principle versus versus a man uh, uh, completely unprincipled, and you see the end result. This is one of the best books I have ever read. If you have an interest at all in politics, this is a must read. If you have an interest in power, in human nature, this is a must read. I learned more about the Senate than I have in my entire life, just in the first 105 pages of this book. And then also, obviously, through the rest of it as well, as you're seeing how bills go through as uh, the the back and forth, the quid pro quos. It, it was a fascinating book in that sense. And, and it was just a, a continual 
set of aha moments of learning how things actually work. It brought back uh, the importance of reading history and especially reading it later on. Uh, Nicholas Taleb has a rule of, of, of only reading old books, but if you have to read a new one, make sure it's about history that is, is, is way in, in the past and not, you know, just a few years ago. Uh, one of the powers of that is, is being able to see what the media is writing, but you're actually seeing what's actually going on. So, uh, Robert Carroll will write about the headlines and what journalists are writing. And it's just so off of what is actually going on. So it, it's, it's important in that sense of, of seeing how things can be completely mis, misconstrued. And, and not that they got it wrong every time. I mean, uh, some of the journalists were actually quite percep- perceptive in this book and, and, and could see right through LBJ, whereas a lot of the senators couldn't. But, uh, but it, it is important to be able to, to take that look back and, and get a fuller picture of the story and not just the immediate news coming at you. And this is a book of high drama. It made me interested in government and the lawmaking process, and that is not an interest that I've, I've had before. It, it provided a base from which to learn further. I, I, I feel like I have a better sense of the Senate, of the House, of how those things were set up at the beginning, of, of what each is supposed to do, what the executive branch is supposed to do, what the judicial branch and the legislative branches are supposed to do. I didn't know a lot of these basics. I'm, I'm ashamed to say that. And so I, I, I've learned a lot of the basics through this book, through this fascinating story, through this fascinating study of LBJ. All right, that's going to do it for this episode. Thank you for listening. I would love to hear from you. I've gotten some emails uh, from from those who have, have read this Robert Caro series, and uh, I've, I've loved hearing from you guys. So thank you for, for writing. And uh, I, if, if you read this series or, or you're wanting to, I'd, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, if you've read it, I'd love to hear uh, what what you think I got uh I got wrong, maybe where you disagree, I'd love to, to hear about that and, and uh, to get a, another side of, of the story. Um, you can follow Books of Titans on Instagram or Twitter. Also, the website is stock full of resources that can help you find the best books and to create your own reading list. I'll be back in two weeks, hopefully to dis- discuss the final book of this Robert Caro series, The Passage of Power. I'm hoping to have it finished by by that point. It is another big book, uh, so I'll do all I can to to get it done. If not, I will have another episode about something else. So until then, keep reading, keep learning, and keep listening. I'm out. I'm out.